Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, my normies and non-normies. How are you guys doing in this afternoon? So I don't know about where you guys are, but I do know that where I am, <clears throat> it is raining on and off. And it is getting, like, really bad out there. It is, like, going hard, then stopping, then going hard, then stopping, then going hard, then stopping. But I missed recording my podcast for, like, I think a two, two, two of my destiny days to do it or something like that. I don't know. I've been feeling so under the weather. I've been out of it. So I decided to step in all the way. Jump in both feet and just do a live. Why not? I mean, I gotta get comfortable to it. I gotta get comfortable with this. It's the whole point of doing this podcast. I gotta, you know, step out my comfort zone and um, really go out there and just put faith all in myself and know that I got myself. If ain't nobody else got me, at least I got me. Shoot, I know I can count on me no matter what. While I'm doing this, I'm also recording for my YouTube. But the topic that I put up for this is parenting mental illness, triggers. Let's vibe and chit chat. I couldn't put, man, I put chit chat. I forgot the other T. Nice going, Lynette. But I couldn't put a long title. But in reality, what I really want to talk about is parenting mental illness, triggers. Yes. Okay. How that goes. Yes. Because let me tell you something. These are all like good topics on their own. So you can talk about parenting on its own. That's a heavy topic as it is. Like, you know, parenting, poof, you can talk about that for hours. Because there's so many stories for people who are parents that they can sit there and tell you or ask for advice or ask for, you know, guidance or for things like that. It, you can go for hours, hours. And then mental illness is another topic you can sit and talk about for hours because there's so many umbrellas under it, you know? So triggers, that's another thing you can talk a lot about and you can talk about for hours as well because there's so many things that can be a trigger. Now you combine these three things together and that's a heavy, heavy, heavy conversation. Where do you go? Which one do you focus on? Which one is actually more important than the other one? Which one overpowers the other one? Which one plays a bigger part? Which one is more, like I already said, more important. But which one plays a bigger part? Which one actually outweighs the other one? Which one in reality is um, the one that leads? You know what I'm saying? Which one is the priority? I can honestly say for me, though, it would probably be a battle between the parenting and the mental illness. That's because both of them are with you 24-7, especially if you have little kids. If you have older kids and they're already out of your household or they're so independent that you really don't have to parent that much, then maybe for you, parenting might not be on the top top like for me, but because my two oldest have autism and mental health, I have to still parent like they're younger because of their autism. So parenting for me and mental illness are going to be two neck and neck with each other. In my situation, they will always be neck and neck with each other because at all times I must parent. I have to parent. How can I not parent? Like if I do not parent, my household will be a complete madness. Like, even with my three-year-old, my three-year-old, she doesn't really understand the dynamic. Like, she knows there's something up. Don't get me wrong. She knows there's something up because obviously she can see it in all of us. Like, the other day when I was recording, <sighs> my neurological neurological issue decided to kick in and I started stuttering. I guess I got too overwhelmed or something and I started stuttering. So when I started stuttering, she started asking me, hey, mommy, why are you talking like that? And it kind of broke my heart some because Beva was actually walking the dog 
And usually when something escalates or shows up or things like that, Beva is normally the one to take her out of the room, occupy her with something else and keep her busy in the other room. But mind you, we're living in a motel, so this is considered an efficiency. It's a one bedroom and then, you know, the dining room, or the living room, dining room, kitchen all together. Um, so there really isn't much of anywhere else for her to actually go. Um, that's why it's kind of hard for me to record things or to kind of not have noise in the background or to have, you know, silent moments where you guys don't hear anything else going on because we're in a tight space. So it's very difficult to give as much of a professional environment as I would like because we're limited on the space. Like, I can't just go, it can't be three. Like, <laughs> I mean, realistically, I wish I could because, Lord, my life would be so much more easier if I could. But, I mean, I have to let her be three, so that's not going to work. We would end up having World War number 70,000 in here if I definitely tried to do something like that. So she doesn't really get it. Um, She does her own thing. So that's why I would say, like, between the mental illness and the parenting for me, they would both be like on the top neck and neck because there's things that she can do that would trigger my mental illness, you know, because she doesn't understand it. Like the two oldest, they've been obviously with me longer, so they obviously uh, kind of know what to avoid, stupid fly, what to avoid, what not to do to not trigger me. Um, and with my son, I could, have, I could say because of his ODD, sometimes he doesn't care and he does it anyways and then gets mad when he has his consequences. But um, that's where, like, I would have to say, again, parenting and mental illness are, like, the top two, top, top ones for me. Like, they go neck and neck with each other. I've been woken up out my sleep because one of them, one of the two, the middle or the younger one, couldn't sleep any longer and they were up and I've had to like watch them because if I don't they'll steal food drinks leave it everywhere make a mess like completely act like there's no home training anywhere so hey Rebecca thank you for stopping in I mean stopping in for stepping in (laughs) but um That's why I say that parenting and mental illness for me go neck and neck on the top because I always have to be parenting and then my mental illness is always there so it doesn't disappear. Like, it's the two things that are always going neck and neck. The triggers come depending on what's going on. So that I can actually say would probably fall like number three no matter what's going on because I always have to be a parent at all times. And then the mental illness is always with me. Like that does not disappear. So this is where I go that this topic that I picked from the parenting mental illness and then the triggers, they can be topics on their own, just like they can be topics together. And I apologize for my three-year-old in the background, but again, (laughs) I have to be a parent at all times. And since we live in a motel, we are limited on space. And I can't only but do so much with what we're working with. So if I want to get my message out there, I got to work with what I got. And this is what I got. But I personally struggle with parenting and not being triggered. Like, I've learned to parent with my mental illness. I've learned to accept that, hey, my name is Lynette. I'm bipolar. Hey. My name is Lynette. I suffer with PTSD. I mean, I can keep going with the rest of my diagnosis, but I don't let them define who I am. Like, I don't let them take control over me. I don't let them define me. I define what they are within my my life, my story, my journey, my day-to-day. But when it comes to parenting, sometimes they do jump in. And they feel like they have a right to say what they want to say when I, when I'm in the middle of parenting. And sometimes I got to stop and go, hey, girl, I mean, you kind of are parenting. I see, Rebecca, you agree with me. Sometimes I got to be like, hey, you got to stop for a second. Breathe. Lyrical. Sweetheart, I'm recording. Can you stop? 
you gotta like look you, you gotta literally stop and say hey sweetheart you can't you can't turn around and parent while you're triggered like that's not okay you gotta pause you gotta take a breather you gotta just who saw send them over there you go think about something else you go do something else then come back sometimes i even tell myself is what you said so far got the point across and just leave it alone leave it alone you don't want to cause no damage you don't want to have to repair nothing you don't want to have to try to see you know what what you caused pretty much and in my shoes i don't know of anybody else's shoes but i know at least in my shoes which is why i try to tell my story as much as i can to help others in my shoes i have damage that was caused to me because my egg donor did not take the time to do these simple steps Lyrical Angel Toussaint. She did not take the time to say, I'm sorry, my three-year-old just doesn't respect when I do these things. I could be sitting at my desk doing nothing. Nothing. Literally, she could see me sitting here doing nothing. And the moment that I decide to record for my podcast on YouTube or write for the blog, even study for my coaching class, she just decides it is those moments that she must call me. But um, uh, back to what I was saying. Uh lost my train of thought my apologies for that so did not mean to lose a train of thought but um yeah in my situation my um egg donor decided to continue to parent while she was triggered so a lot of the parenting that she did i can't even tell you to this day what it was for or why because i legit don't know what lesson i may have learned from her I don't know what lesson I may have learned from that situation, honestly speaking. So there's times that I can be sitting down while I'm parenting and I'll become triggered, but all of a sudden it, it'll just click on me. Lynette, stop. You're parenting while triggered. You don't want to be that woman. Stop. Do not continue. And again, I'll ask myself is what I have said to this point covered enough of what I've needed to say, let it go, let it be, you know, dish out whatever the punishment is, whatever the consequence is, and just move on. And then after I've de-escalated and calmed down and I've had a moment to think and breathe and sometimes chastise myself, you know what I'm saying, for what I did and for not catching it, sit down and reevaluate the situation and see where I went wrong at, I'll then go talk to my kids. And have a conversation with them. And yes, I'll apologize because I'm human. And sorry does mean that you're not going to do it again. But like I tell them, I can't say I'm sorry because I'm not sure it will happen again. But I will try my hardest to not do the same action over again. I'll try not to put myself in that situation again. I'll definitely try to learn from the scenario so that I don't put myself in this situation. But I've come, you know, this far. I've learned from my mistakes. I've learned from, you know, my story, from my upbringing, from what I had, what I had, what happened to me while growing up. And that's the whole reason why, you know, I'm able to do that. Ooh, I get to add music. Oh, sorry, you guys, but I get to add music. I just realized this. Let's add some music to make this even better. Whoa, that's kind of loud in my ears. Hold on. I'm sorry, it's kind of loud in my ears. Let's do some calm music. Okay. That works out good. All right. Wait, did I just not? Where did it go? Okay. So that is something that's imperative to know. But guess what I did forget to mention? In order for you to even be able to realize that you're parenting while you're triggered, you have to kind of like know your triggers. You have to know that you are triggered. 
you have to know when you're triggered. You have to know, you know what I'm saying? You just have to understand your body. But it is imperative, though, to not parent while triggered. Like, real quick, seriously, don't make that mistake. I've done it plenty of times. I've done it plenty of times, and it's not something that you want to do. I mean... I can give you my ask my opinion, my suggestions from both aspects. I can give it to you from a child whose parents constantly triggered, parent, whose parent constantly parented while triggered. My apologies, my words just would not come out my mouth. But um, or you can um choose to realize that you are triggered stop take a breather and you know regroup and then start all over but it's imperative though that you do take the moment to do that because honestly parenting is hard enough as it is like can we all agree with that can we agree that parenting alone carries such a load that it can be so overwhelming whether you have a partner or not it can still be overwhelming kids can do so many things you know what I'm saying and I'm talking about a child a regular child a child that has nothing extra going on a child that has not been diagnosed with anything can still be a handful you know what I'm saying they can still have their devious ways they can still have their knucklehead ways and then let's just say you are a parent with a child that has something going on that has a diagnosis that has a condition that has whatever going on that makes the parenting then 10 times harder you know or now let's say you're the parent that has something going on that has the mental issues that has a diagnosis that has a condition now that makes parenting for you 10 times harder than what it should be. And I've come to realize that when we don't live in our truth and don't acknowledge our truth and don't accept our truth, not only does it make parenting hard, not only does it make parenting our children hard, it just makes our lives 10 times harder in general. It just makes it so difficult because we, at least in my shoes, I learned and I realized that I was always on the defense for everything. I felt like I had to have an explanation and I had to defend myself for everything. Now, though, I've come to realize that this is not the case. Now, 42 years later, a year later into finally living my truth and finally accepting my diagnosis and finally accepting hey I have mental illness hey I have mental health hey I need medication even though it doesn't do anything but whatever that's another story another time but hey I have mental health and I don't care who knows and I don't care about their opinions or their thoughts and I really don't care how they feel about it because this is my life and I I have kids that count on me and I have kids that have you know conditions going on that have diagnosis that need me they need me to be the best of me they need me to be that person that I can be saying that mom that that best friend if need be that go-to person that confidant that rely on person that person that they know is always going to have their back that is always going to be there for them that will always always try their best to you know give them what they need no matter what that is you know what I'm saying I have to be that person you know, I have to, I don't know why I keep looking at the monitor and, and recording for y'all, sorry, but 
um, I have to be that person now. Like, that person has to be me. So in order for me to be able to genuinely give to my kids what they need, I have to be okay with who I am. Because they get almost everything that they have, almost everything that they have from my side of the family. So how can I help them cope or deal with what they have going on if I am not accepting mine? If I am not coping and dealing with mine? If I'm not acknowledging mine? And it took me so long and I wasted so much time and so many years like fighting it and not acknowledging it, not embracing it, not, well, my joint wasn't as bad as others that were around me, okay? But that didn't mean that I didn't have something. That didn't mean that I couldn't get the help. But I was brought up with getting help. Okay, I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna say that because that's not accurate. It's not that I was brought up with getting help isn't okay. And my, I guess, we just didn't acknowledge it, I guess you can say. It just wasn't something that we just talked at the dinner table. Or whenever the family got around, it wasn't something that we just sat down and go, Hey, by any chance, did you know that so-and-so happened to be bipolar? And they're going through whatever their stages are right now. Like, it wasn't something we just sat down and talked about. It wasn't something discussed. Like, I have a cousin who the last time that I had heard about her, her diagnosis was bipolar, uh, was bipolar schizophrenia or something like that was the last that I had heard of her diagnosis. I really do not know what it is now because I have no contact with, you know, my, uh, with the family. So, but it wasn't something that, like, you know, you, I would, me, okay, because my egg donor is different from myself. She's nosy. She likes to know everybody's information and everybody's business, which is why she would pick up the phone and contact everybody to find out their business. It wasn't necessarily because she really cared how they were doing or what was going on, which people really think that that's what it was, but it's not. I can tell you guys, honestly, it's not. The woman is just nosy. She just likes to know everybody's business and she likes to gossip. So you can't be a gossiper if you don't know people's business. Oh, this is so cool. I keep forgetting that. If you don't know people's business, you can't gossip about it, right? So that's why I would never tell her my information because I caught her plenty of times gossiping about it to other people and then would get upset about it when I would tell her. Makes no sense. Sorry, you guys, I'm going off topic, but... In my family, it wasn't something that we just sat down and discussed. We didn't sit around the dinner table. We didn't sit in La Marquesina and drink some coffee with Pan and, and just chit-chat about people's mental health. Like, it was not one of those things that you just flat out talk to your family about. Like, I feel like all my life I battled depression. I just never understood it, apparently. I never knew that that's what it was. I recall being like 14 years old and always being locked in my room at my grandparents' house. Never really wanting to come out to socialize with my cousins or anybody else because I always felt like nobody understood me. No, and I felt like they weren't for me, that they were against me. And, and honestly, a whole bunch of years later, and where are we? Where are we? We're nowhere because everybody on in what should be my family has taken egg donors side of the story and ran with it nobody bothered to inbox me and say hey Lynette what's really going on none of that everybody just took whatever she had to say to whoever and passed it on to each other and took the side of the story and just ran with it and because I'm not one to vocalize what I do because what I do or did was my business you know what I'm saying? And if you call me, hey, and I felt like sharing it with you, I would. But if I did it, that was my prerogative because, again, it's my life, my life, my problems, my business. If I wasn't asking you to help me or whatever, I didn't have to divulge anything. It's not like I was calling you and asking you for money. You know, 
know, it's not like I was calling you and asking you for help, so I really didn't have to share any information, so all everybody really had to go on was whatever the woman would say. And with that being said, if you are supposed to be my mother and you're supposed to care for me as a parent, then why would you turn around and turn a family against your only child? But that's neither here nor there. That's for another topic and another time. We're going back to parenting and mental illness, triggers. Let's vibe and chat. All right then. So, but no, it all goes intertwined together because I didn't know I was battling depression from a kid. When I had my first kid, I didn't even know I was dealing with postpartum. I never got treated for that. I never went and got help because I never even knew I had depression to begin with because I never got treated for that either. And I never got help for it either. So I ended up, you know, not getting any type of help for my depression, for my mental illness at all. So how am I supposed to parent and do all these things? How? How? Like... How? When I never, like, did anything to treat any of these conditions. You know what I'm saying? And for me, it was so imperative for me to be the opposite parent of the one that I had. And I took my childhood as a learning experience. And I decided that when I grew up and I became a parent, because I didn't even know if I wanted to have kids, but I decided that I was going to be the complete opposite of what I saw growing up or what I had growing up. And I didn't really have a parent per se, so I didn't really know what parenting was supposed to be. What is parenting supposed to be? What do parents do? You know what I'm saying? Do parents hug you? Do they kiss you? Do they hold you? Like, what what do they do? Do they tell you they love you? Like, what do they do? Because honestly, I didn't really have one of those growing up. I didn't know what it was all about. You know, and then I have people telling me now, like, I have people now, you know, kind of envious or jealous of the relationship that I have with my kids or with the way that I deal with my kids because I treat my kids like adults but I also treat them like kids. And I know that's very difficult to understand, but for certain things where I know that they're, they can comprehend, I treat them like adults. For other things where I know they are still kid-related, I treat them like kids. And I break it up, but I also don't treat them like my slaves because they're not. I didn't give birth for them to wash dishes. I didn't give birth for them to sweep a floor. I didn't give birth for them to clean a house. I didn't give birth to them for them to be my maids, which is what I was growing up you know I gave birth to them for them to be my kids for me to love them for me to love on them for me to to have a, I don't know like I, I don't know how to explain it like I do the complete opposite my egg donor always made me feel like I should have just been given black dress to how it means just to wear black dress, white apron a hat and a feather duster and I should have never been told that I was her child because I always felt like I was just the maid you know, I felt like I was the maid I never felt like I was her child I felt like she always parented with me when she was triggered and I never understood what the heck she was parenting about I can come up with so many scenarios right now and I still wouldn't be able to understand what she was yelling about. I can probably remember one and I would understand why she was heated because I can relate to it only because if I look at it, I'd be like, darn it, if I will, I would have seen that report, she would have been heated too. And that was, I was in ninth grade and I had did a report for a history class on Puerto Rico. And the typewriter that she bought me was broke and never did the backspace, so it wouldn't correct. So it didn't have the autocorrect on it, the backspace. So I can, I'm 42, remember people. 
okay this was typewriters all right <coughs> excuse me this was not computers this was typewriters sorry and um the backspace i used to, I used to have a, a ribbon that would auto correct and would erase it so it would take it off of the paper so that you could retype correctly well i didn't have the ribbon i think it was so i don't remember what happened and i wouldn't fix it so whatever errors i would make when i was typing i couldn't fix it then i remember i ran out of ink like it was just a pain <clears throat> then i tried writing it then i couldn't write it because my handwriting she always complained about my handwriting but then when i got older complimented my handwriting all the time i just i couldn't understand that about her either it just never made no sense to me i just think it was her excuse to not have to write things out she was lazy so she wanted me to write them out and use that as an excuse to compliment me just so that she can get me to do it so she wouldn't have to do it but um she liked to play a lot of mind games but i remember i did the report i actually did get to type it up because i did finally get to convince her to go buy the ribbon for me but like a fool I didn't number none of my pages. Go figure, right? Something so simple and so basic, I forgot to do. So guess what happens to me? I end up going to class, right? I'm in school. I'm chit-chatting. I'm BSing. In the, I, I don't remember if I was in the hallway or if I was just I was in class and I wasn't in my chair yet. I was just BSing, whatever. And I drop the folder, mind you. I hadn't even, like, put the papers in the whole puncher thing, like, you know, in the prongs, because I didn't have a whole puncher, and I think I was waiting for school to borrow his whole puncher so I could do it. I, um, dropped the folder. All the papers fought everywhere. Everywhere. So I'm now rushing to pick up all these papers, and I'm trying to hurry up, and put them all in order. I'm trying to put them all back into the folder and then I get this whole puncher. I remember if it was his or if I borrowed somebody else's and that's why I had to do it in school if I had to ask somebody to bring theirs. I can't remember off bat. Like visually I can see the classroom. I can see everything. I just can't see that part. But I remember I pulled the holes. I put it in the folder and I turned it in and I ended up getting a C. And the reason why I got the C was because the papers were not in order. Since the papers were not in order, when he went to go through the report to read it, it didn't make any sense because it wasn't in order. It wasn't organized. So I ended up getting a C. Um, when she saw that, she got highly ticked off. Um, she was like, this is a disgrace. This is an embarrassment. Like, how could you? This is where you're from. Like you should have gotten an automatic A, like this is unbelievable, and started to put me down, which is the typical, you know, everyday scenario for me, so that, it's raining hard, so that didn't, um, didn't really bother me per se much, but she was just going in and yelling and screaming, and just, she lost her casket with me, and I'm, I'm just sitting there looking at her, I understand. I get it. Don't get me wrong. I really do. But I just don't understand why are you being this way? Like, why is it so deep? Like, why are you making me feel more horrible than I already felt? Mind you, I already felt like I let my grandmother down, like I let my grandfather down because I did a report on our where we come from, our origin, you know what I'm saying, our ancestors, excuse me, and I had, you know, perfect pictures, like it was a really nice report if it would have been placed in order. Now, the teacher was nice enough to let me submit it again in order, you know, correctly, and I did end up getting an A long run but after I spoke to him and explained to him what had happened to me that morning right before I was turning everything in why am I so positive right now right before I was turning everything in excuse me I you know I did get you know to talk to him and explain to him everything but that experience with her 
made me feel a certain type of way. It made me look at her differently as well. Because it was just like, no matter what I do, you're always going to have a problem. And it's never going to be right. Like, when am I ever going to do something right that's going to make you proud? And I don't like that feeling. So that's why I also say, be careful when you parent. Don't parent while triggered. I still struggle with that to this day. And I think that's another reason why I get anxiety sometimes when I have to do something. Because I'm afraid of how the other person is going to react. Um, If I'm doing something for somebody, I get anxiety when I go to give it to them or when I turn it in. Because I'm afraid of how they're going to react. Especially with that's the way that she used to react for everything almost. Even if she liked it, it was just like she had to find something negative in it to just not let me shine. Not let me have, you know, a, a positive moment. But that's why it's always important when we parent, we have to be our best self. Try not to do a wall trigger. Try to be your best self. Try to to praise, not point out the negative. Because the negative is going to stick. It's going to stick with them. You know, it's going to stick. Try to point out as many positives while you're, you know, redirecting, recorrecting. Whatever you want to call it. Like, don't, excuse me, I am so sorry. It has to be the rain. And all of a sudden, I'm hungry again. It's getting it's lunchtime now. It's lunchtime now. But um redirecting, correcting, make sure that you're showing up as you, as the best you as possible. Your kids will appreciate it. We do have to parent at the moment. That does make a difference. You know what I'm saying? I do understand that. Some kids, because of the ADHD and the autism and everything else, may not realize if you parent later on. Um why you're parenting but don't underestimate them some kids do have the ability to hold on to that memory they can wait 20 or 30 minutes while you de-escalate and that's where you have to start doing research and learning yourself and figuring out ways where you can de-escalate yourself quicker so that you can get to that parenting so that you can get to that redirection so that you can do your job under the best way possible without harming your child or doing anything else that can affect your child in a negative way. I hope that makes sense. I feel like I've been talking for hours. I I mean, this is a little bit different for some reason for me than when I record. I am not sure why. I think it's because I know people can pop in, but I hope that makes sense. Um also always have to take into consideration that parenting is hard so let's not beat ourselves up because yes parenting is very 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 hard and yes being a mental health patient having mental illness is not an easy walk in the park either okay and then having triggers and dealing with triggers and coping with triggers and learning how to live with them and how to survive with them yes that is also not a walk in the park so if you take all those three things and if you have to deal with all those three things your journey is not going to be an easy one either and that is why it is imperative that like my blog said you get a PhD in your diagnosis and you take that time to learn yourself okay you take that time to understand who you are it is imperative that you do so it is imperative 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 that you do so That is the only way that you're going to be your best self in any other aspect of the the world, of your day, of your life, of the century, of the universe, of the year. I don't care. But it's going to be the only way that you're going to be giving your best self. And then you're never going to question 
was it this or was it that? No, you're going to know that it was the best you at that moment. And that is all that is going to matter. It was the best you. Then you're not going to have no insecurities. You're not going to have any doubts. You're not going to have any questions. Nothing. Because you're going to know it was the best you. And that's all you can ask for, for the best you. Let's always, always give the best to us whenever we're doing anything that has to do with parenting. We have little lives that count on us. We have little lives that depend on us. We have little lives that look up to us. We have little lives that want to be like us. And if we want them to be like us and we're okay with them being like us, then we have to be the best us. We have to make sure that we're showing them the best us. Sorry, I had to drink some coffee. That at all times, we are giving them the best us. We don't want to repair any damages. You know what I'm saying? It's easier to mend something, but to have to repair, that's a lot deeper. That's a lot more work. It takes a lot more thought. It takes a lot more concentration. It takes a lot more energy. A lot of more effort. A lot more of, a lot. Yes, more effort. I hope you guys understand where I'm coming from. And I hope this makes sense. Sometimes I feel like I get so into a topic that I start rambling the way that my mind starts to dish it out and I forget to organize it before it hits my mouth. And I'm sorry if I take you guys onto a roller coaster ride, but I do have to be non-apologetically me. I do start my episodes, my content, any content that I do, it does not matter what it is. Whether it be the blog, whether it be the podcast, the YouTube, Clubhouse, no matter who it is, I do start with an agenda. I do have it all planned out. But the moment that I start talking, the person in me takes over and I start talking from the raw me. The raw me starts to give raw content content that sometimes I don't even know exists until I start talking and then I start remembering things and I just start giving you guys raw material and after I leave and I you know post everything and I'm waiting for it to upload I have to then meditate on what I just divulged because sometimes I don't remember these things until I'm telling them to you guys like the story that I just told you guys about the report, the report about Puerto Rico that I did for the history class. That story, I hadn't told that story in years. I had forgotten all about that story. I just remembered it now while doing this content. So now after I'm done with you guys, I'm probably going to sit here while, uh, you know, I have to get my coaching and stuff. I still haven't been able to do an actual schedule as of yet. The house is finally, like, you know, where we need it to be. Just small, minor touches and organization here and there. But uh, the rats last night were no joke. We have two that I saw last night and a mouse. And I'm trying to still wrap my mind around all of that so I can still function. But now they're making me have to leave and leave the living room area earlier. So it cuts back on what I'm able to actually accomplish and get done. So it makes my days. Oh, sorry, y'all. I have to go.